the aggressive manager collapsed to the floor, looking up at me, in total shock. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. I create them with fleeky visuals, dipped in artificial love. We start with a bad manager, who ritualistically humiliates his employees. Until he unexpectedly gets his first, meaningful kiss. Knocking him off his pedestal. Followed by a story, about an employee who was brutally bullied for years, yet his boss didn't care. Well, he did care in the end, when his company went out of business because of it. Lastly, a private prison facility, fosters nepotism and promotions. So when those in power, favor their friends to be appointed to the highest positions. They pushed aside the knowledgeable employees, that should have been promoted. One of those employees, won't stand for this, and is willing to shut it all down, leaving the facility, radioactive. Make sure to sneak unnoticed to the like button's office desk, and leave a post-it note saying, Emergency, need you ASAP. Then add an unrecognizable signature, and leave it be. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts, might be disturbing to bad managers. I work for a large global IT company. In my team, we are part of a larger extended team and an even larger still divisional team. The manager of this division is called Raj. He's based in the States, and is what many would call the poster boy definition of a corporate suck-up. According to him, he is in constant video chats with the CEO, and has a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with him. He also appears on much of our division's promotional emails and photographic material, so he's a company-wide recognized person. As for me, I am a trench-working techie from Scotland. My direct manager is always happy with my performance, and I am somewhat known in our extended team, but not so much in the divisional team. Although I was aware of Raj and his reputation, I had never worked with him directly. Until this event, which was a while before the outbreak. I got invited to a company-wide collaboration event in America, which we usually use for technical training and innovation discussion. We got there, and there were some initial social events and meet and greets. Raj was amongst the group, and his general demeanor seemed appropriate for the reputation which followed him. We went into the first day bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was assigned to a group of 10 people to work on a problem with some coding. All was going well, until we came to do some group presentations. For our group, a young woman named Natalie was speaking for our results. It all seemed to go okay, but after the session was over, Raj asked to see Natalie out in the hall. From inside the room, we could hear Raj literally screaming at her. Many, many offensive slurs were used, and we could hear banging on the wall as well. Natalie returned to the room a sobbing mess, much to the shock of everyone. Raj returned as if nothing had happened. This pattern continued over the course of the week. Raj would single out people for these, one-on-one -on -one performance critiques. He would go into detail about how work was substandard, and how they needed to improve. All while taking group photos for corporate comms for the higher-ups, orchestrating shots to make us all look like one big happy family. I spoke to some of my own team back home about this in my downtime, and it does turn out that this has always been rumored behavior for him, just no one ever knew someone who had experienced this before. I don't know what the job culture is like for this role in a place like America, but here we have dignity at work regulations. Performance criticism is fine, but not when you are engaging in ritualistic humiliation of your employees. I knew exactly what I was going to do. For the next few days, I made sure that I was delivering more presentations than anyone else, and really making an effort to attract attention. As hoped, he asked me for a chat, and pulled me into the hall. He didn't wait for the door to close before starting his rant. Experiencing it firsthand was interesting, he claimed I had no idea what I was talking about, even though it had likely been about 20 years since he did any technical work himself. He was vile, shouting and spitting in my face. I also learned what the banging noises were, he would punch doors and slam his hands on the wall near me, as if to try and intimidate me. I was prepared mentally though, and just smiled and nodded during the entire rant. He looked angry that I was reacting this way, and by the end of it, I thought he was legitimately going to burst a blood vessel. When he was finished, I asked him if he was done? He told me to get out of his sight, and that's when I did it. I gave him a Glasgow kiss. For those unfamiliar, it is a headbutt. And it is not the first headbutt I've delivered in my life, having been brought up near Glasgow. He collapsed to the floor, holding his nose, looking up at me in total shock. I leaned down, and in my most Glaswegian accent, I whispered to him, if you ever disrespect me, 
or my colleagues again, I'll knock the taste out your mouth next time, pathetic scum. I went back in the room, while he did not. Inevitably I got the HR call. Raj was in the room as well, and I could see that he had two black eyes as a result of the encounter. I was asked to explain myself, and I told the truth, mostly. I explained about his abusive behavior, but focused specifically on the hand slamming, and how it had been intimidating me. It hadn't really, but I massively played up on this aspect of the encounter. I described the headbutt as a reaction, when he slammed the wall right next to my head with his hands. I wasn't sure what story he had told them, but I was sent away after this. I ultimately ended up with a disciplinary on my record, but no further consequences. Other team members were interviewed over the next few days, and once the pattern of abuse was established, Raj was terminated from the company. The most satisfying part of this, was the day after, when everyone on the course went out for dinner. Natalie insisted, that he stand next to her for the division group photograph, black eyes and all. I think that photograph contributed to his downfall, in some poetic way. I live in a relatively small city in North Carolina, and started working as a dishwasher at the young age of 14, soon working my way up through the restaurant over the following two years. The original owner of the restaurant, a 50-plus-year-old woman, had grown interest in selling the restaurant, after 10 years of great reviews. Honestly, it became the best place in town to go to. A younger male walked in one day through the kitchen door. I thought he was a new employee. But later that night, I found out he was the one interested in buying the restaurant, and the sale went smoothly. Fast forward a year, and the new owner, let's call him Herb, denied the only time I had ever asked for a raise. As the $7.50 an hour I started on, was not a living wage. He told me I didn't work hard enough, when I had gone as far as to wait on tables, cook, as well as do lots of the cleanup, maintenance, on top of my job of being their dishwasher. Thankfully for me, my manager, who had listened through the office door, called him out on it. She made sure I got a raise. She really did me right. A few more months down the line, Herb let several meat coolers break down and refused to fix them or get new ones. My nice manager didn't like to work for him, as she would always get blamed for things breaking down. Herb's the owner, it was his money, so he had to approve anything we did. So nothing happened. This went on until one night. On the night we celebrated her 10-year anniversary of working there, she ate the cake my sister and I made her then also proceeded to quit on the spot right after. The responsibility of management fell onto my sister, and she was forced to take the promotion without the raise or anything. She managed his restaurant for nine months, only to feel unheard for any issue she brought up with equipment, or workers. She would always be told, No, we can't do that. And after she had had enough trying to convince him on repairs, we were left without a manager for a period of time. Forcing him to drive three hours, to come and manage the restaurant himself. This went on for a few weeks, until a new guy was hired, to be my help in the kitchen. At this time I became the head cook, so it was my responsibility to teach him the ups and downs of the kitchen. At the beginning this dude was kind and seemed really caring. But unfortunately, that was at first. He kissed booty so much, that I was overlooked for the kitchen manager position. And he got the position. It didn't make any sense. This became even more troubling when, Within a short time of him working with us, he changed into a brutal ass hat, faster than you can blink. The guy loved to watch football within the kitchen, commanding to use my phone and speaker. He would cuss at the waitresses, and that's not where it ended. He seriously tried to physically fight me, on the daily. I could handle the unfortunate situation I was in during that time, but it went too far on another occasion. It all started when he started loud mouthing me. But one of the waitresses heard it, and she was fed up with his behavior. She walked in and confronted him, telling him. I'm done with your crap, you can either apologize now, or you can leave. He has been here a lot longer than you, and you were trained by him, and yet you think you can disrespect him, I won't stand for that. He immediately answered, by raising his hand. But when he was about to swing, I got to him in time, decking him before he got to her. In return, he slammed me into the already broken coolers. Unfortunately, this incident didn't change much, because he kept working there and we didn't resolve the issue we had with each other. But over the following months, the rest of the team had encounters with his dark side, and got to realize he was a great a douche. Many of us had tried to tell Herb about his actions, but our complaints were met with a measly. It can't be that bad, he's such a nice guy. After not being heard or listened to for so long, I began planning my exit strategy. 
I had it all planned out for the last company meeting. I made sure to walk in wearing a suit, already having found a new place with my fiance and a new job. Everyone knew I was overdressed, and this raised questions. Yet the mean manager was nowhere in sight. I enjoyed the meeting and told some trusted coworkers I was planning to quit that night, but I asked them to keep quiet. Then the moment came. Herb asked me publicly to share my opinion on how to boost sales and how I think we can better the restaurant. I looked at Herb and answered sarcastically but in a serious tone. Oh me? Now you want to hear what I have to say? I stand up to emphasize what I'm about to say. Why would I help a business, much less the owner of this business to better themselves when I have been blown off for months? Within this restaurant, I was bullied for months and when I mentioned it, I was brushed off. Have a great day Herb. Let me update you that you don't have a cook anymore. Today is my moving day and I found a new place to live with a better job. with an owner who will listen and show respect to their workers who won't force their workers to cook green slimy chicken past its expiration date i quit he proceeded to beg me to stay because he had finally fired the mean manager he said is there any possible way i can get you to stay i answered in his exact customer support accent no we can't do that as i walked out he followed and kept begging me to stay saying i couldn't leave because he actually did what was asked of him I already solved the problem by firing the mean manager. I ended our conversation that day by simply telling him, "Too little, way too late," and proceeded to walk out. This fallout was followed by other coworkers who were on my side that stood up and left also. This is not where it ends though. He had purposefully not given me my W2 forms for taxes, and after a few days of harassing him for my tax papers, I finally got them. Then, I received a letter from the IRS. saying there was a problem with my tax forms therefore i couldn't receive my tax refund calling up the irs i found he had not submitted any of the forms he was supposed to as our employer and when contacting him to rectify the situation he proceeded to say i don't recall employing any of you this year after you left with no reason or right little did he know i record every conversation on my phone and i reported him to the irs attached to the email I sent in the voice recording in an MP3 format, and I also sent in photocopies of my check stubs and copies of my W2s, along with informing my coworkers having issues with their taxes to do the same. Herb has since lost his business, his business license, his wife left him and took their kids after finding out about his fraud. Herb is now facing upwards to 60 years in prison for multiple counts of tax fraud. It turns out we were not the only business he owned and refused to pay taxes. or file the correct tax forms when needed. He had also withheld the safety precaution pay during COVID and used all of it to fix up the restaurant. He did us all really dirty and I get to sit back happily typing this with a smile, knowing he got what was coming to him. For all of you wondering whether I ever got my taxes and my money, yes I did. Thanks for listening to my life story guys. I need to ease my way into my story, then I'll tell you how and why it happened. names will be omitted for anonymity reasons of course just to set up some background i was working for a privately run correction facility pcf for short and anonymity and had been doing so for nearly 10 years even though the facility is now long since closed down the pay is nothing like what state or federal employees get paid and it was a constant show of being shorthanded i worked my way up through the ranks from being a frontline officer in the units to visitation sergeant to shift commander and finally security specialist Bear with me as this does take a bit to explain why the upward steps came. When I was a floor officer, I worked with others assigned to the same unit to get a general code of conduct going. This unit ran really well and most found the unit to be the easiest unit in the facility to work with. This because all of us ran it nearly identical and were consistent and fair. Eventually, this caused my shift commander to move me to other areas as a test and eventually into visitation. Visitation ended up being one of the most demanding positions I worked at the facility simply because prior officers had done so little and were so behind. Along with my partner, which regularly changed because of the stress of the position, we got the visitation department up to code and went from taking 5 visitors a weekend to over 80 visitors a weekend on the regular. After doing this for roughly 3 years, I moved up to sergeant of visitation, which was less stressful as it was more supervisory in handling complaints. as well as necessary policy revisions. After nearly 2 years I moved into shift commander. Here I identified several issues with our overtime policy 
to include significant favoritism issues, as well as corrected several reporting flaws that we were constantly being dinged on by PPMU. This is the private prison monitoring unit of the Department of Corrections in my state. Because of this, PPMU personnel and I became very close, as I worked with them on further clarifying and correcting some of the things we weren't doing quite right. This led to creating several spreadsheets in Excel, that more or less made tracking overtime, vacation, assignments, and various other little managerial things far easier to track. So anyone would barely have to do much, other than add their employees and fill out assignments for each shift. This allowed us to get away from favoritism and more easily spread the copious amount of overtime fairly, so everyone was doing their fair share. Instead of just a handful constantly being taken advantage of, while also making it easier to explain monthly shortages. Higher-ups loved it, PPMU loved it, and many of the overworked front-line staff were delighted by it, cause it allowed them to finally get some rest after 16-hour shifts. But some hated it, because they couldn't skate by under the radar without doing their share of mandatory overtime. Part of the new hire agreement, was signing that you understood there was mandatory overtime and refusal could lead to disciplinary up to termination. During this time, we had some changes in administration and the creation of a couple positions that were required as part of our contract with the state. This was renegotiated yearly, this is important to know later on. This included at least one captain per shift, a captain of housing, had none prior, a security specialist, and changing several positions from officer to sergeant level. This is where the problem started. A number of the staff started filing complaints, because while the state mandated these positions, the private company didn't like to cut into their profit margin and begrudgingly agreed. However, our administration saw this as a way to get their friends in cushy positions. Company policy says to promote from within, but our administration found ways to make it seem like most internal candidates didn't meet qualifications, while hiring old buddies into newly created captain and administrative positions. I was eventually moved to security specialist and backup shift commander. My new role was creating facility-specific amendments to administrative regulations, to ensure we were following the purpose of administrative regulations. This entailed how our equipment was managed, key set permissions, restrictive housing unit, visitation, perimeter security, and making sure all guests, visitors, vendors and volunteers entry policies, were followed to include mandatory background checks. I also ended up taking over several other Excel spreadsheets, that were required to show each department in the facility was accordingly staffed the required hours, per our state contract agreement. It was quite the handful to say the least, and by closely following the administrative regulations, I was quickly making more enemies, as a lot of the issues started showing how incompetent the administration was. Namely the major, housing captain, and one of the other captains, that were buddies the major got hired on. As security specialist, I reported directly to the major, deputy warden and warden as well as by extension the PPMU. We had regular meetings to discuss issues and how to remedy them, then it was my job to author the adjustments, so the major could review and sign them along with the warden, before they went into effect. By this time, I was the sole manager of five major Excel spreadsheets in the facility, used in various departments. I had to teach all of the methods to whom it may concern in those departments including major and captains, as it was to eventually become their responsibility to manage them. This included giving them encrypted passwords, if those spreadsheets ever broke slash corrupted, as Excel is known to do on occasions. However, this wasn't the case, as I was constantly the go-to guy in order to get them fixed. After a couple years of this, in comes the private corp to renegotiate the contract and then suddenly my position responsibilities get reorganized, into their respective captain or major responsibilities. At this time, a new captain position comes open and I put in for it, along with several others with similar experience to me. Also one that has absolutely bare minimum experience, but is close friends with the major and another administration sitting on the hiring board. Needless to say, they get the position and I get bumped to their old position as housing lieutenant. I ask my major why I can't be moved back to shift commander, where I can at least still work on all the policies and sheets I've made up to this point, to which my major says to me. You are not a captain. And we needed a captain there. Not you. Just be happy you didn't get demoted and stop trying to be a captain. I smile and reply, okay, but if you move me to housing, I no longer have responsibility over all the work I currently do, as that is all security related responsibilities and housing has different responsibilities, right? It is important to note that at this PCF, Housing and security acted like two different entities from one another, and security had final say over housing, 
but it was housing's responsibility to address housing issues, before coming to security. This meant moving me to housing lieutenant instead of back to shift commander, would mean I no longer had any right to correct them when they weren't following the policies I had written prior. And certainly meant I had no responsibility over any of the spreadsheets they managed. Well that is how it works here. The major replied. You just didn't get the captain position. I'm sure we chose the best person and there will be no issues. Just do what your new position is, because you aren't a captain, you're a housing lieutenant and you will do only what is part of that position's assignments. At this point, he gives me the biggest shit-eating grin, as he has waited three years to put me in my place, for making his job harder by actually having to do his job. Okay, I say and leave the room without saying anything further. Start countdown, nuclear revenge. Now I've also submitted complaints of harassment and policy violations, with updates as further incidents took place, causing the complaint to stay perpetually open and this was added to the complaint with documentation. This was only another notch to a long-going issue, one that various others I worked with had also joined in on, as they had equally been railroaded, harassed, discriminated against, to include lost wages and saw the nepotism taking place. It is important to know that the policy on nepotism for this company included language stating that, Family and close friends could not have unfair advantages in promotion or job placement over qualified or current employees. Now it isn't immediate, this change, but after a couple months, I'm now working as a housing lieutenant and taking care of my new responsibilities. I've shed all responsibility of prior spreadsheets, policy adjustments, and anything that doesn't have to do with my immediate department. It is about this time when things start to go noticeably wrong. Even though I took the time to train, assign management rights, and give password control of all workbooks to the responsible department heads, most of which was the major, it doesn't take long for it all to go to shit. The new captain doesn't know a thing about Excel, let alone any of the reporting software a shift commander has to use, sometimes multiple times a day. He's very lacking in knowledge of R and quickly gets various offender and staff complaints. The major isn't keeping track of the spreadsheets he is now supposed to manage, contract compliance tracking and facility entry tracking, because he is just as clueless when it comes to anything computer related. Visitation is slowly going down the drain, cause none of the other captains kept open communication with the sergeant slash officers to help deal with issues and staffing concerns. By this point, PPMU is very unhappy and demanding that these areas be brought up to compliance within 30 days. Or they will start to pursue fines against the company, cutting further into their monthly profit margin by nearly $1,000 per day, out of compliance for each issue, on top of other fines for failure to fill contractually obligated positions. Needless to say, these are fines that add up very fast for those who don't know. At this point, my housing captain calls me into his office with another of the admin, to give me the assignment of fixing these troubled areas. After reviewing the assignment, I smile back and tell him. Sorry, the major told me I wasn't a captain anymore, and that I was to stop doing captain work now that I was a housing lieutenant. This is beyond my assigned post to fix, as it requires me to tell security what to do in order to fix it. We should work, as a team. You don't want the team, to suffer for this, do you? He says to me. Then the other admin pipes in. Lieutenant, let me get this right. You are refusing to do this, because you didn't get the captain position. I then give the same shit-eating grin the major gave me when he told me months earlier. Well, that is how it works here, isn't it? Security manages security and housing takes care of housing, unless it jeopardizes the security of the facility, then it is security's problem, right? I then roll my shoulders into a shrug, I just simply lack the authority to do that job and the major assured me that you and the other captains all had it under control. I even showed it all to you before I was reassigned, remember? By this point I can see that the captain is getting visibly upset, as they are now entirely responsible for all the work I used to do. The other admin at this point looks at me again and asks, So, are you refusing to do this assignment? It isn't that I'm refusing to do the assignment, it is just that with all my new responsibilities as housing lieutenant, I simply don't have the time to do them and the work of a captain, which the major made very clear, I'm not supposed to do the work of any longer, as I am not a captain. I then stand with a smile. So no, I am not refusing the assignment, I am following the orders of a higher superior, that told me to no longer do anything outside of my assigned duties as a housing lieutenant. Last I checked, the post orders I signed, stated I was only to do assignments that are of housing unit responsibility, which also is signed by the major and the warden. Now if you don't mind, I really have other responsibilities I need to get back to. 
I then smile to both of them and walk out of the office, as I was currently in the middle of getting vacation request and working on offender housing assignments, to ensure we were in compliance with SDG, security threat group, and racial balance requirements for the nearly 1,000 offenders in the facility. About 20 days later, I receive a phone call while on vacation at 8 a.m. from the stand-in warden. Our warden had been put on administrative leave pending investigation, along with said housing captain. Is this lieutenant? Asks the stand-in warden, to which I groggily answer, yes it is, who is this? This is stand-in warden and I'm sitting in the room with housing captain, who has brought something rather startling, to my attention. He is saying that you refused to do an assigned duty, that resulted in the inability to track various things in the facility, is that correct? At this point I sit up in bed and answer, yes, that is correct, but that is because. I don't even get to finish as this stand-in is clearly upset at my admission and interrupts me. You do realize, that this is insubordinate behavior that is gross in nature, don't you? Anger clearly in his voice, but a controlled anger. I can only imagine that the housing captain is sitting in the room with a shit-eating grin. Am I going to get to answer, or are you going to interrupt me again? It seems you have already made your mind up on the matter given the tone of your voice, sir. I responded. You're correct, I've decided that your negligence in performing duties as assigned is gross in nature, and believe this meets the required parameters for immediate termination, effective now. He pipes back, obviously not happy with what I said. You do realize I'll be adding this to my complaint of workplace harassment and retaliation if you do so without getting the full story, don't you? This means that I will be adding your name to the complaint, for failure to do your due diligence in getting the full story, on top of the warden you are currently replacing, the housing captain sitting with you, the major and several others for violation of your own disciplinary policy. I'm shaking at this point, angry that this is happening and that I have to resort to this extent to get the point across. And yes, I do have access to all of the documents, including all current policies of the company, the current contract between the company and the state, and will pursue this if you continue with this? You do what you feel is necessary, and I am doing what I feel necessary. As of this date, you are hereby terminated. You will receive in the mail the disciplinary form and decision, to include a formal answer to your complaint by the week's end. You see, if you're part of that complaint, you no longer can issue the formal answer according to policy. It will now have to come from corporate HR, who will have to agree with your decision and already has copies of the complaint as well. My voice now shaking from my own anger. Well, then you'll be hearing from them I suppose. The phone call ends, but not before I could hear the change in his tone of voice as well. I wasted little time in updating my complaint and notifying the corporate HR person I had been in contact with for about six months now. The glorious aftermath. A week later, a notice was sent to all employees that the facility would be closing their doors permanently in 90 days, and I continued to receive my full 40-hour-a-week pay, until the day those doors closed, without ever having to return to work. I was then later allowed to file for unemployment, as well as the technical reason for loss of employment was through no fault of my own. I later found out from the HR department, that the facility was closed due to four major reasons. Reason number one. The company was no longer making any profit due to poor management decisions that lead to PPMU issuing upwards of $75,000 in fines per month, on top of out of control overtime, due to shift commanders not properly tracking their shift officers overtime, vacation, or days off. Reason number two. Many of the administration and captains had received numerous complaints of company violations, to include harassment and nepotism. Reason number three. PPMU investigated the qualifications of some of the recently hired slash promoted administration and captains, as they too were suspicious that they didn't meet proper qualifications for the position. This means they were entitled to back fine all the days those positions were filled, simply because they were unqualified candidates. Reason number four. The investigation found all complaints to be valid and would require termination of nearly all of the current administration. Consisting of two captains, and one HR for failure to correct the issues, meaning it was easier to just cut their losses rather than try to fix it. Why was this nuclear revenge? Well, the state had to quickly move and relocated nearly 1,000 offenders, 250 people lost their jobs, of which 15 of them ended up fired due to policy violations, resulting from the investigation of nepotism and workplace harassment. A few had workplace discrimination and resulted in one person, 
who was not receiving fair wage of others of similar position, to receive back pay of upwards of $38,000. My start of complaints, led to others filing complaints for similar reason in the nearly two years, leading up to this adding to documentation of the issue, that resulted in the closure of the facility. Even knowing the impact this had, if I were to live through it again, I would still have done the same thing. You stay till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. I want to take this moment, to thank you, I really appreciate you, because you bring me a great amount of joy. Subscribe for future uploads and show your vengeful devotion, by tickling the like button, without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. And I'll be seeing you, in the next one.